All right. <clears throat> so at the end of class last time, we learned about what a critical reference was, and we learned what limited critical reference was, and we also learned the significance of an algorithm satisfying um, limited critical reference. Do you remember all those definitions? <laughs> Let's just do a really quick review. We'll just put uh, one or two slides up here. First of all, a critical reference talks, um, is about the existence of a variable in some code. And a variable V is a critical reference if A, it is assigned in one process and has an occurrence in another process, or B, it occurs in, a, in an expression in one process and is assigned in another. And then we had these examples. And then, oh, and then we defined a li li limited critical reference. How many critical references can you have in a single statement to satisfy li limited critical reference? How many? How many are uh, permissible? Zero or one. Zero or one. In each what? In each program? Statement. In each statement of the program. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And then we did this example, and we identified whether each one of these references was critical or not. Do you remember? Is this one critical? Do you remember if that one's critical? Yes. It is. Good. Is this one critical? Yes. So does this satisfy limited critical reference, 2.3? No. Is this one uh, critical reference? Now remember those two different temps. Is this one critical reference? You're right. Is this one a critical reference? Yes. Okay. So how many critical references do we have in that one? One. one. Is this one a critical reference? Correct. Oh, wait. Did you say no? Yes. Yes, I said no banana. <laughs> yes, we have no bananas. Yeah, yes, this is a critical reference. Is this one a critical reference? No. Oh, so how many critical references do we have here? One. one. So, conclusion, this does satisfy limited critical reference. Are you with me? Because each statement has either one or zero critical references. And what is so great about critical references? about limited critical reference? We said even with this algorithm that we just did 2.4, we said even if these things are, are subdivided into loads and stores at the assembly language level and they all get interleaved, guess what? Our analysis is unaffected. Do you see what I mean? That's the significance of limited critical reference. Now do you remember what limited critical reference is? Or should we review it again three nanoseconds from now? <laughs> Are we good? Okay, now this next, uh, this next one uh, thing is a little, all of this, all of these concepts are a little elusive. Elusive. This next concept that we want to in, uh, understand is the concept of volatile variables. Okay? Volatile. And this is a little bit tricky to understand, so I've, I, I have uh, kind of a, a detailed explanation here. So let's just take a look at this algorithm 2.8. Now this algorithm 2.8 is just a nonsense algorithm to illustrate the definition of or, or the significance of what are called volatile variables. All right? Now check it out, you guys. Over here in process P, we have two local variables, local one and local two. Right? And let's just see, we have P1, P2, P3, P4, and P5. And P1 says N gets some expression. Yeah, so just think of some arithmetic expression, and n gets that value. And then p2 is some computation not using n. All right, so that's just, you know, y and z and some other stuff, right? So that's some computation not using n. And now look at p3 and p4. p3 and p4 has 
what's common to P3 and P4? On the right hand side, what's common? Say it again. What? There's yeah, there is computation on the right-hand side, but what's what about that computation is common to both? N plus three. N plus five. N plus five. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. N plus five occurs here in P three, and N plus five also occurs here. Now, do you see? Oh, and then oh, and, and local one gets this, and local two gets this, and then afterwards, what does N get? It gets local one times local two. Right? Is everybody with me on this? Now watch this. Can you, see, can you see a way that the compiler could actually optimize this instead of doing one state, one, instead of translating one line and then independently translating the next line and then independently translating the next line and then independently translating the next line. Do you see a way for it to actually look ahead and consider all of these things as a group? and do a better job, by better job we mean m such that it executes more efficiently, such that it ex executes faster if it considers these all as a group instead of just considering each little individual line. Do you have any ideas about how it could do, about what it would do, how it could do that? Well, come on, what about P3 and P4? It is. P3 is P4. Well, I mean, local one. Yeah, it's assigned differently. Yeah, and why did, how did, what was that? So how did you, what did you notice about that? You noticed that N plus 5 was common to both. So instead of adding N plus 5 on this one, and then adding N plus 5 on this one again, since it already added the N plus 5 here, it could save that temporarily and then use, and then reuse that here. You see what I'm saying? And furthermore, <laughs> not only that, what about, what about here, n gets some expression, right? Well, um, n, uh, or no, let, let me back up. What about this p2? Here's a, a computation not using n. So if this computation doesn't use n, then what about the order in which these things have to be executed? It doesn't really matter. The compiler can figure out which order matters and which one doesn't. Are you with me? So now, check this out, you guys. Let's look at this. An optimizing compiler could translate the statements in process P as follows. So what it could do is, instead of, instead of over here, instead of saying N gets this sum expression, what it could do is it could do temporary register 1 gets that expression, right? And not actually, e and actually not even assign it to n. Are you with me? And then this computation not using n could happen because, and the fact that n didn't get assigned to anything doesn't matter. Are you with me? And then what, and then what would happen here? And then what could we do here? Here we could do p3 gets tempereg 2 Sorry, temporary, temporary register 2 gets temporary, temporary register 1 plus 5. Well, what is that temporary register 1? That's the value, that's, that's what n is, you know, would have been had we assigned it that way. Do you see what I mean? And then, and that's plus 5. And then local 2 could get temporary register 2. Now, what's temporary register 2 now? That has the value of what? would have been n plus 5, right? And then the local 1 could get temporary register 2 times 7, and we only had to add 5 once times 7, and then we could finally do our assignment to n here, local 1 times local 2. Now does everybody see that by arranging it, putting these things out of order, and keeping track of, this, of all these lines as a group, the, if, this, if these executed one after another, just like this, at a lower level of abstraction, the results would be identical to, way, to the way they are here, right? The final, the final, the final result would be, the, the final state would be the same, yeah. Can we cut out P1 as well and just do the sum expression in P3? Um, 
Y yeah, yeah. There's more than one way to do this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? And so, and so, but, look you guys, if we consider each one of these to be atomic, and there's some interleaving that could go on between this one and this one, see, this one requires the value of n. So what would happen is, if that happens, our analysis of what could happen with the possible interleavings is all out the window. Are you with me? So what happens is programming languages, and in particular Java, has this concept of a volatile variable. And here's what volatile means. The optimized Here's why. The optimizing compiler does not assign to n in the first statement. The original statements p3 and p4 are executed out of order. If there were no, if there were no concurrency, the translated code would be correct. But if there is concurrency and interleaving, then any translated code might not be correct because the compiler can't predict where the interleaving is going to happen. So therefore, when you specify a variable as volatile, that instructs the compiler to load and store the value of the variable at each use, rather than to optimize away these loads and stores. So if you declare that n is volatile, the compiler will not do this. You see what I mean? Instead, what it will do is it will execute it will translate each line one at a time. And it won't do the optimization, it won't do out of order optimization, and it won't do saving, you know, it won't optimize the loads and the stores. Is everybody with me on that? And the reason it does that is if the programmer wants to analyze the program assuming, assuming, you know, only interleaving at these, at this level. Are you with me? Does everybody see, does everybody see what, how that, what the concept is there? So the, the, main, the main phrase that you want to remember is, rather than to optimize away these loads and stores. So it doesn't optimize them away by doing stuff out of order and saving some results and not assigning it until later. Do you see what I mean? It forced, so the code might be a little less efficient, but it's, but we can analyze the code correctly without having any deleterious effects happen because of the interleaving of the optimized code. All right? So that's, that's what a volatile variable. A lot of people, for some reason, people think, I mean, I don't, I don't know where they get this idea, but for some reason, a lot of people think, oh, volatile, that means atomic. Now, what's the definition of atomic? Yes, it cannot be further interleaved. But that's not what volatile means. Volatile means, it means just this. It instructs the compiler to load and store the value of the variable at each use. Okay, okay now you guys, we are finally to the point where we can actually start doing some programming. Okay. So, we no longer use C minus minus to teach concurrency in this course. It has been replaced by C plus plus. Consequently, the remainder of this video and some of the videos in the future have been edited and are being recorded offline. So, let's take a look at concurrency in C plus plus. The first program we're going to look at is called count a dot cpp and concurrency in c++ uses a built-in class named thread that's the name of a built-in class in c++ and the way it works is you pass a function as a parameter to the constructor that the thread executes so the interesting thing about this approach is that C++ has adopted fun the functional programming style, which we are already familiar with, to implement concurrency. And the, the key uh, method 
of a thread, P, is called join. And it's, uh, this works similarly in C++ as it does in Java. So it's important to know what p.join does. If p.join is executed inside main, then p.join forces main to suspend execution until p terminates. So we'll have uh, some more to say about that uh, in a few minutes. But first of all, let's take a look at the code itself. So here is uh, the code in count a.cpp. Notice that what we have to include is we include this library called thread in addition to the usual uh, standard library, standard libraries. And here we just talked about volatile. And so we have n, which is an integer, and it's declared to be volatile, which means that the compiler uh, does not opt does not optimize the uh, for efficiency it does not optimize but instead it does the load and the store for each statement uh, individually so that's a global variable because it's outside of main and in this program count a dot cpp we're gonna have two threads one thread will be named p and another th thread will be named q So p run is going to be the function that p executes, and q run is going to be the function that q executes. And each function is given a parameter, an input parameter, m. And let's take a look at what p run does. First of all, it, it uh, sets up a local variable called temp. And then we have a for loop. For int i get 0, i less than m, i plus plus. So this, ex this loop executes m exactly m times. And then it does temp gets n, n gets temp plus 1. So this is similar to the code. In fact, this is a translation of the code that we saw in our binary textbook earlier. And then q run does the same thing. So here is main, the main program. And um, we have a, an integer variable, local variable, called mymax. And this s to i is string to integer. That's what that stands for. And that argv sub 1, that is the command line argument for the program. And we'll illustrate that in a in a minute when we do the demo. Basically what happens is when you run the program you give it an integer and main gets that integer from the command line and uses it in the program. So for example if, if, if we run the program with an integer value on the command line of 10 then my max will get 10. So what does this program does? It does C out, so it streams to the output. The value of my max is, and then 10, for example, if that's what we input. And now check this out. We have thread P. So thread is, is the type. P is the, thre is the name of the thread itself. It's like a local variable, and its type is a thread. Because it's declared inside main, it's a local variable. And p run is the function that we just looked at in the previous slide. Let's take a look again. So you see p run is that function. And you see how it's p run int m? Well, here the m is my max. My max is the actual parameter, m is the formal parameter. So if we started the program with a, with a 10 for the command line, then my max would be 10, and that would be the parameter that is passed to p run when p starts executing. All right. So now, this statement that we're looking at, thread p, when that executes, that actually starts the concurrency. That thread now begins executing, and at that at at the, at this point, two programs are running, main 
and thread P concurrently with all the interleaving that might happen. Then on the second, on the next line, we have thread Q. Now in this, after this statement executes, now there are three processes running, main, P, and Q with all the interleaving that might happen in between. Then what happens is main executes p.join, but what does p.join do? Let's go back to this slide. p.join forces main to suspend execution until p terminates. At the beginning of the main program, only the main is executing. It executes int my max string to integer. It executes the C out. Then when main executes thread p, there are two programs running two processes running, the main process and thread P. Then when the next thread Q executes, now there are three concurrent programs, three programs running concurrently. Process main, thread P, and thread Q, with all the interleaving that might happen between all three of them. Now when p.join executes, that forces main to stop until P terminates. Once P terminates, then main can execute Q.join. But what does Q.join do? That forces main to stop until Q gets finished executing. Then after Q.join executes, and we're at the first C out statement at the bottom, at that point there's only one, we are guaranteed that only one concurrent program is executing, namely main. And it puts out the value of N should be, the value of N is, da 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 da. And of course, what should happen is the value of n should be 2 times my max because each thread is executing 10 times. And so if we, in, if we input 10, then that my max, that, that'll be 20. And so my max should be 20. And it tells us what the actual value, then it tells us what the actual value of n, of n is, and then the program terminates. Okay, so, so you can think of the statement thread p p run comma my max that's kind of a strange syntax because p run is a function and we have that function without the parameter list and you can think of it as if it were thread p and then we pass p run with my max uh, actually in the parentheses after the function name which is kind of like the way you would you you would normally call it so that's the syntax is a little strange here but these you should, you should think of that first statement, the same statement in the actual program, thread p, parentheses, p run, comma, my max, as if it were p, and then p run, and then passing my max as a parameter, or my max is the actual parameter that corresponds to the formal parameter m. Okay, with that now, what we're going to do is we'll do a demo. And we're going to use C Lion. We no longer use uh, NetBeans. And we're going to use C Lion, and I'll show you uh, how to set up and run our first C program with concurrency. Okay, so here's our demo. And here's the C Lion IDE. I assume you guys can follow the instructions on the course website that explain how to download and install it. This, uh, if you've done data structures with us, this is the same setup. This distribution is called COSC450 CPP distribution, JSTR. And so we expand this out. And here are all of the project, the programs that we're going to be using in this distribution. And we'll look at count A here. If you expand that down, here's, and double click on here, you see the source code, which is what we just looked at on the slides. And to run this program, what we do is, first of all, we've got to make sure that um, if this was select, if this had some other program on it, you got to make sure that it, that you're in count A. And then the first thing we have to do before we run it is we have to do this drop down again and do edit configuration. So while this is count A, you do edit configuration. Remember we talked about having the input come from the command line? Well, under program arguments here, let's put 10. That's what we talked about in the lecture a minute ago. And then um, do okay, apply. 
and OK. Actually, you can just do OK. And let's run it and see what happens. Boom. The value of my max is 10, the value of n should be 20, and the value of n is 20. Hmm. Seems to be working correctly. Let's try it again with a different number. Instead of 10, let's do, let's crank it up. Let's go up to 1,000. OK. And we'll run it. And, hmm, the value of my max is 1,000. The value of n should be 2,000. And the value of n is 2,000. Well, everything seems to be hunky-dory. Our program has no errors in it, right? Seems to be working correctly. Well, let's just try it one more time. Yeah, see, it's still working correctly. Well, let's do it. Let's change that um, input value from 1,000 to 10,000. And now, you know, uh, things should be good, doing good. Are we good here? And boom in. What? The value of my max is 10,000. The value of n should be 20,000. The value of n is 10,000. It's only half what it's supposed to be. What the heck? Well, we'll run it again. It's probably just a little glitch. It'll probably be right now, huh? <gasps> what the heck? 10,000? 20,000 should be 20,000. The value of n is 11,698. Where did that number come from, for Pete's sake? Here, let's try it again. Yeah, maybe it'll work. Maybe we were just unlucky. 10,000 instead of 20? That's weird. 10,000? 11,720? This is way unpredictable. 14,368? What the heck? 14,325? 15,280? What's going on? It appears that our program is unpredictable. Giving unpredictable out, but and always less than what it should be, right? Why is that? Maybe let's go back to, let's see if it, was, if it worked. Uh, let's go back and edit the configuration. Let's go back to 1,000, see, instead of 10,000. See if that works. Well, it's correct. The value of my max is 1,000. The value of n should be 2,000. The value of n is 2,000. Hmm, let's do it again. 2,000. Let's do it again. Ooh, this time it didn't work. It's 1,000 should be 2,000. It's only 1,000. Wow, it didn't even work for 1,000. But usually it works for 1,000, but not always. But with 10, I bet it always works. Let's do that again. Let's go to Edit Configurations. Let's go down to 10. And let's run that. Should be 20. It is 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 20. Well, now, this is really interesting because for really small values of n, it seems to always work. But for some big values of n, it seems to break. What's going on here? This is a mystery. I wonder, can you figure out what's going on here? So we just demoed count a.cpp. And we took our input from the command line, showed how to do that. And our conclusion was, when we ran it, that the program works for small values of m, but not for large values of m. And the question is, why? Why does it work for small values? Well, here's what's happening. Do you remember the concept of timeout? So when the main program started, it initiated uh, thread P to start. And when P started, it was a loop. It, it, it executed a loop. And when the value of M was 10, the loop only executed 10 times. Well, man, that's really fast. I mean, the computer can do that, can execute a loop 10 times really, really fast. And so what happens is, 
with, with that small value of m, that thread ends before thread q even has the time slice is so large that the thread that thread p completes its task before thread q even gets it even starts up. So what happens is p executes um, to completion, and then q executes until completion, and then the main program ends. So here, so here, here's the reason. It's because for small values of m, each thread will complete its entire computation within a single time slice. But on the other hand, if you force, if you have a large value of m, like 10,000, then what's going to happen is thread p is not going to be able to complete its loop 10,000 times before the timeout occurs. So it's going to be interrupted. And it's going to be, it's going to time out. And then there will be interleaving. Then Q will start. And then if Q starts, and it also has to execute 10,000 times, it will not be able to finish its job in its time slice. And then Q and P will be interleaving, and main will be interleaving, and those undesirable effects will happen where, where temp is uh, saved but not incremented and stored in between there a timeout will occur dur during that time and it's impossible to predict that's why the, that's why the results are so unpredictable we're going to modify our count a dot cpp program by using a random de delay to force interleaving due to the time slice timeouts even for small values of m and here's what the code looks like we're going to use a utilities um, here in this slide. You can see on count b.cpp, this code has uh, is in, is including util450.cpp, and in that utility library that we're going to frequently access, we have written. Uh, I'll show you the code in a minute. We have written a a function called random delay and you can see here in p run inside the for loop each time we do the for loop we execute random delay 10. now this 10 means this is a random delay between 1 and 10 milliseconds and then we do temp gets n and then we do another random delay between 1 and 10 milliseconds and then we do n gets temp plus 1. so what these d random delays do is they make the thread pause for approximately however many milliseconds it says. And that random delay is going to be a, a random delay between 1 and 10 milliseconds. It's based on, a, on a, it uses a random number generator. And so it's impossible to predict what the delay is. But what that does is that inserts a delay in between the statements that we want to force the interleaving to occur, even for small values of n. So and and it, with count b with count b we're not we're not taking the input we're we're not taking the input from uh, the command line we're just always executing ten times each loop ten times so so here's the uh, rest of the code q uh, the q code is exactly the same at random delay ten and notice here that in the main program we don't take the the input from the command line we just always we just start up p and start up q and then p.join and q.join and then the value of n is and now when we run this the value should always be 20 but I mean it would always be 20 but even though the loop executes 10 times the delay is going to force an interleaving so here let's do a demo okay so here's our demo we'll open up count b here double click on this and here's the code for count b that we just looked at. We see each loop executes 10 times, not only for P run, but also for Q run. And here's that more the simple main program. And uh, so to run this, we will take a, uh, take count B as our, for our configuration. And we don't need to worry about taking the input from the command line because the program doesn't get the input from the command line. So we don't need to set that value. And so now when we run it, 
we're gonna, now we're going to run count B. Now, now normally it would be 20, but it's not going to be 20. Uh, here again, it's going to be, so we have to compile. So you he, see here, the value of N is 13, even for that small value. But the reason is because, again, it's because those delays force the timeout, which forces the interleaving. So we can, this is going to be unpredictable because those delays are random. See here, it's 17, 15, 15, 11, uh, 13. I think if we do this enough times, we might actually get it to be 20. Uh, maybe not. You know, a very on a, in a very unusual very unusual circumstances where the interleaving is harmless, but it looks like we can't. They're always they're always at random, and they're always less than what the uh, correct value should be. And here, let me show you the utilities. Just to, we can take a little look. See here, here under util 450, you can see how we coded that up. So here's the uh, we'll put this window away. So here's the uh, the this here's here's the random delay function, okay, that we are using here. Basically, what you what you have to do is you might remember this from. Um, I think we used a random number generator when we did the um, quick sort and data structures. Do you remember that? We used a random number generator there, and uh, this is the you have this random engine default random engine and. You can read through this if you want, but I mean this you won't be tested on this at all. And if you ever want to see what the exact here actually here, let's do this. Let's um, you can actually see what the delay is. This might be an interesting experiment. Let's modify our um, our random delay to actually print out what the delay is each time we do it. So there's going to be ten uh, ten plus ten. There's going to be twenty. No, there's wait. There's two delays per. There's two delays per thread, or per loop, per thread. So that would be, there should be 40 output statements. We'll, we can see what the delays are. Uh, okay, so now let's, let's run count B again. And check this out, sports fans. See, the, the final value of N is 12. All right. And look at this. This is really quite interesting. It says, down here it says delay equals 6, delay equals 10, delay equals 2, delay equals 9, 9, 8, 2. So, it's any, so the delay is anywhere between 1 and 10 milliseconds, right? But what's interesting is that what happened here, this says delay equals, and then delay equals 0, and then delay equals 1, but then 9. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that, is that there is interleaving in between these C, in between the C out statements. So if you can visualize what's happening, what's happening there, that's uh, so what's ha what, what happened here is this C out, this first C out statement started to execute delay equals equals. And then at this point right here, at this point right here in the code, an interrupt happened and the, it, the, it timed out. The time slice kicked it out right in the middle of this statement. And then Q started up, you know, and then Q started up, and then Q did its, you know, delay equals zero, and then, and then delay equals one, and then P got, and then finally this nine probably belongs to this delay equals, you know. So, uh, oh yeah, it would be because th this delay was nine milliseconds, and then uh, process Q only had, only had a delay of zero and a delay of one, so it was able to do that real quickly, and then finally. Process P kicked in and the nine was there. So this, this is really great demo, don't you think? I mean, it shows visually exactly what's happening with what can happen with interleaving. When you and of course, you know we haven't solved the interleaving problem yet. I mean, we haven't solved the the the, the concurrency problem. It's going to take several. It's going to take many sessions, many hours for us to analyze and figure out how to actually make a program that has delays like this actually run correctly every time. But this is a vivid illustration of what the problem is. All right.
Okay, so here's the code that we just looked at on this slide for util450.cpp that implements that random delay function. And you can, uh, here again, I would not expect you to be able to uh, reproduce this or understand exactly how it works. But basically what it does is to uh, call the random number generator, that uniform int distribution, the first line in a random delay, uh, calls a, the random number generator to generate a uniform uh, distribution of integers between zero and delay. And then there's that line that we commented, that is normally commented out, that we uncommented to, to uh, show us what exactly the, del the delay was. And then the last line in random delay is the one that actually causes the, um, the delay itself. Th there's a sleep for function that um, gets called for this thread. We set it to delay for d milliseconds. So you can kind of see, get an idea there for how that code works. <clears throat> and then here on the next slide to recap is that the results are unpredictable because of the random delays. And we saw the random delays by uncommenting out the C out line. And we even looked at how the interleaving may occur within the C out streams. So that was very quite instructive. Now, <clears throat> the next thing we're going to do is we're going to demo how to do concurrency with Java. Now, before we do that, we have to um, understand a fundamental difference between Java and C++. And this is quite a nice exercise because it illustrates the difference between two major implementations of programming languages, namely the difference between compilation and interpretation. So let's review what these two implementations are. First, C++ is a compiled language. So as shown in this slide, figure 7.26 from a <coughs> my computer systems book, <clears throat> we see that it, before you can run a program that's written in C++, you have to compile it. So what is actually happening there when you do that compilation? Well, that first row of boxes shows the compilation process. And <clears throat> the box on the left is the input, the box in the middle is the processing, and the box in the, on the right is uh, the output. And so what the compiler does in C++ is it takes the source language, the source program written in C++. The processing is the compiler, which is a program. And it's a translator that's written in machine language. And what it does is it outputs the translation of the C++ program from C++ into machine language. And then when you actually execute it, so it takes whatever input the application has and executes it and outputs whatever the application uh, app uh, is programmed to output. So that is compilation. Now, Java is not a compiled language. It is an interpreted language. <clears throat> and so when you, you still have to compile a Java pro source program, but when you compile it, you do not compile it into machine language. Instead, as this figure shows, you compile it into what is called object byte code. So the object byte code, <coughs> when, it, when you actually execute a Java program, you are not executing the object byte code. What you are executing is what's called the Java Virtual Machine, the JVM. And you probably recognize this phrase from having Java installed on your computer. And so what happens in the execution phase is the Java Virtual Machine is running. Your, your program, the program that you compiled is not running. The Java Virtual Machine is running. But what it does is it takes the object, the object bytecode and it interprets it as if it were running on a Java machine. And it also takes the application input. And then the output is the application output. So the, and so consequently, 
the the execution of a Java program is always slower slower than the execution of a compiled program like C++ or C because you're not actually executing the the object code you're executing the Java virtual machine and then the object code the object bytecode is just one input into that machine so it takes longer to execute so why do this? Why is Java interpreted like this? Well, the advantage is that the compilation into object bytecode is extremely fast compared to the compilation of of uh, and of a compiled language. That's that's one aspect, and then the other aspect is it's easier to maintain cross-platform uh, compatibility because it's all you need is because every Java translator can be the same on any platform. The only thing you need that needs to be different is the Java virtual machine that that must be written f in a platform specific manner. And so and it's much easier to maintain a, a Java virtual machine for the various platforms than it is to maintain a complete compiler for the various platforms. So there are advantages and disadvantages. The main disadvantage is that it's a bit slower. And we will see exactly the implications of this when we, when we uh, run our Java uh, program.